hand the microphone metaphorically to you. Okay, thank you, Alan. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Good, okay. So, so first of all, um, sorry I'm not there. I've come down with a cold this week and I thought I didn't want to cause a mass panic by having a coughing fit on stage. So um, I apologise for not being there and I appreciate the help of Alan, Mark and Linda in helping me deliver this remotely. And you know, I, I get that giving them remotely is not as much fun, and, but also it's difficult for the speaker to kind of judge the audience. So I'm just going to assume you find all of my jokes really hilarious, okay? And I'm just going to go with that assumption. So, um, yeah, I'm slightly not talking about what Alan said I was going to talk about, but in a roundabout way, I am, okay? So just go with that. So what I'm really going to try and talk about is you know, the, the theme of the conference is disruption. So, um, and I wanted to talk about how open education relates to that. So when I was having a, a chat with Alan, um, he suggested maybe that I should talk about how open education is disrupting higher education. And I thought about doing that, and then I decided not to do that, okay? So uh, <laughs> as Alan will know, that's probably not unusual. So I just, by the way, thank you for the introduction, Alan. Alan was on the interview panel when I joined the Institute of Educational Technology back in whatever that was, so uh, it's partly his fault I'm here. Um, so, my, so what I'm going to do in this talk is, first of all, to say why disruption is actually a bad idea and why you shouldn't talk about it. And then I'm going to propose some other models and how we might think about other models. And then I'm going to take you on this personal journey through openness, which uh, Alan outlined in his intro to me, and then hopefully kind of get you to think that maybe open education is a better model for thinking and talking about higher education than disruption. So uh, that's my approach. So the too long didn't read overview is open practice is not about disrupting higher education. It's an alternative model to that quite dominant disruptive narrative we often hear. So um, I hope these slides are advancing for you, by the way. So uh, I'm going on to some history of disruption. So Clayton Christensen published this book, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it was around when um, you know, digital technology was very new, and it was and it was an interesting idea actually. So what he proposed, if you don't know, it was that big companies often fail because they focus on the wrong thing. They focus on what he calls sustaining technology. Sustaining technology is about making your existing product better, and often that's what your customers will want. And he was saying these new companies come along and they do better because they focus on what he called disruptive technology. And the point about disruptive technology is it's often worse initially uh, doing a lot of those things that the, the companies are focused on, which is why they dismiss it, but it goes on to kind of replace them. And it helped this theory, and I've helped us think about um, why did digital photography you know, suddenly become so popular? And how did Kodak and a massive company kind of almost disappear overnight? And why did Microsoft, this small little startup, become bigger than IBM, where everyone just thought it was you know, world dominant and would never, never sort of lose their place? So it was a kind of interesting model and an interesting explanatory framework to think about those things. So it wasn't all bad. But then it became a real problem. So this is Clayton Christensen, uh, who came out with the theory and who recently passed away. Um, and I think what his problems were, instead of it being kind of an explanatory theory, it became a goal. People wanted to be disruptive um, and to achieve disruption. And actually, when you began to look at all these claims around disruption, it seemed to very, really rarely happen. What you've got was sometimes an innovation, sometimes something working alongside an existing industry. Um, and it really became a kind of Silicon Valley myth. You know, if you go into Silicon Valley, every startup wants to be you know, a disruption to a particular sector. So then it became over applied. Um, and I think part of the problem was people like Christensen that were, were really invested in it. So he's got his own institution. So, so you stop being an academic, seeing if it's actually a good explanation and start trying to make it be the thing that happens. And so largely it just became meaningless. Um, but it doesn't mean it didn't carry on kind of very powerfully. So actually, if you really stop and think about disruption, it's it's not a thing you would want. It's not something to desire. It's a kind of extinction of event. You know, it's the it's the meteor hitting Earth, you know, and the dinosaurs around. So if you thought about what when people say we want to disrupt education, you should really stop them and ask, what do you mean by that? Because actually what it would mean is, you know, what happens in disruption is the incumbents disappear, you know, so, you know, Kodak disappears, digital photography largely, um, normal photography largely disappears and is replaced by digital, those kind of things. So that would mean 
teachers and schools disappear and you have some a new commercial entity that comes in and has a monopoly because actually what disruption is about is establishing a mono monopoly being the key provider for the stuff um, and it also suggests that all incumbents are incapable of change because they're focused on the sustaining technology and don't understand the disruptive technology so actually it's just a really bad theory for education because education doesn't happen like that you know the whole point of higher education is that we have these institutions that have been around for hundreds of years and that it kind of operates on a different time frame and a different sort of sequence to a lot of kind of Silicon Valley startups, which are kind of very sort of peaky and bursty and get taken over, bought out, something new comes along. The whole point of education is that it operates over these longer time scales. And as you see, disruption really happens. So actually, it's just a really bad idea to even think about applying to education. Um, so not only is it just kind of a bad explanatory theory, it actually comes with it quite a nasty and sort of dangerous legacy to think about. Uh, so I think amongst these are, it really helped people legitimise undermining of labour. So actually a lot of these models that came along, ever said, oh, they're disrupting things. So like Uber, Airbnb, the reason they can do that is because they don't have labour laws. They sort of get around the, all those labour laws, all that kind of legislation that other companies uh, are stuck with. And so, but they could they could do that by saying, "Oh, we're being disruptive," and everyone, everyone thinks, "Oh, they're being disruptive. That's great." And it's because it's so desirable in itself, people kind of let them get away with that. And if they just said, "Actually, what we really want to do is, you know, do away with labour uh, support," then people would say that's not so exciting. Um, one of the things I really dislike about it is that this whole point that it says you shouldn't listen to, to the incumbents, the people who have experience and expertise in the area, because they're too focused on this sustaining technology. It's almost like their, their minds are warped by that. So it dismisses that. And I think as we've seen in a kind of post-truth world and where you know, people say we, we've had enough of experts, that's a kind of really dangerous mindset to, kind of, uh, to propagate really. And also it's very uncooperative. The whole point is you want to develop monopoly. You don't want to work with people. You want to say we want to disrupt it and replace the existing people. So that doesn't propose a model of cooperation and working collaboratively and i think it kind of really wasted a lot of resources because what happened was people say we're going to disrupt this we're going to disrupt this and then of course disruption wouldn't happen and they'd say oh well we'll move on to the next thing we're going to disrupt that we'll disrupt that uh, and so instead of trying to come together as a kind of collaborative exercise they just went on to the next thing and the next thing um and i think importantly the type of language we use and the model we have frame our thinking. So if what, you're, if what you want to achieve is disruption, you'll go about things in a certain way. Um, and I think that's kind of really helped shape our, our relationship with technology, particularly the education sector. So in short, this is pretty much what disruption wants to do. So I want things to be different, smash it all up. Um, and it also applies to much of politics in 2016. So kind of, this is where I feel that we've kind of got to. So that's my trashing of uh, disruption. Um, so thinking about alternatives that we might want to have. Um, so in, I think in education, we think we co -op, collaborative. That's how we understand, that's how we work. Um, we want to kind of focus on problems, specific problems we have, and how can we address them. Uh, we'd want it to be learner centric, like what's best for our learners rather than what's best for an degree or a company. I think we'd want technology that seems to support educators rather than replace them or you know, kind of make them redundant or reduce them to kind of just box ticking. Sorry, that's my dog just coming in from the walk. So, as Alan said, he's actually the star of the show, so he's very happy. Um, I think we've got a model that's a better fit with education that kind of matches a lot of the characteristics of education. And coming from the uh, Open University, and I think like lots of us men in higher education, we want to kind of emphasize social justice. As well. So, my proposal is that open education meets a lot of those. That's what I'm going to try and convince you of. So I'm going to take you on this uh, personal journey through open education. I apologise, it's kind of very self-centric and egocentric, but it's as a way of kind of explaining the different uh, types of open education and I think how each of them meet those criteria that I set out. So, um, that says uh, I work at Open University. Um, so we celebrated 50 years last year. Um, 
And back then, if you talked about open education, people generally thought of things like open universities. And they developed this model that was very successful and kind of replicated around the world. And um, it's kind of really captured in the mission statement now. I'm sure a lot of you have mission statements at your universities and those kind of things. And often they're a bit, as the American would say, a mum and apple pie. It's kind of all, it's good things and you can't really disagree with it. But it doesn't really mean a lot. Whereas I, I propose to you the uh, the Open Universities mission statement is really kind of a work of poetry, really. It's quite simple, open to people, places, methods, and ideas. And actually what that captures was how they how they go about doing it for the do. So open to people meant you know, no entry requirements. Open to places meant you know, business, education. Open to methods meant using technologies uh, such as TV at the time and uh, audio tapes and all those kind of things. And open to ideas and meant you know, things like that we might not propose otherwise. You know, so summer schools all those kind of things. So and captured within that model, uh, within that mission statement, was actually how the university itself would operate. And that pretty much defined what open education was uh, for quite a long period. So this version of open education really was a, you know, a force for social justice. It was about kind of widening participation, getting people into education who otherwise were excluded, people who couldn't attend full-time education, people who might, we used to be called the second chance university, people who missed out uh, earlier on and wanted to get education later on. So it's kind of really about trying to bring more people into, into higher education. And so pre sort of 1990s, when we talked about open education, we generally meant uh, open universities. And then in the 90s, with the advent of the, uh, the internet and uh, digital technologies, we can see these kind of new versions of what openness might mean, which aren't related to um, uh, open universities. But just to come back uh, briefly, so uh, Alan mentioned, so back in uh, 99, we launched um, the OU's first uh, online course. Um, so this was delivered all, all via the web, um, uh, no printed materials. So I, I had a kind of epiphany moment with this. So um, I was chairing the production of it. And I sat down in a meeting with all the kind of people who are usually there for our course production. And I explained what we're doing. So we're completely online, and that's it. And about half the room stood up and, and walked out because actually there were people from the warehouse, people who were printed units, like so. and it made me appreciate kind of what a what a cultural shift going online was for some of our university. Uh, and as Alan said, we had about fifteen thousand students in there. So I sniff at your idea of MOOCs being invented in twenty twelve. Um, but the point of this was they demonstrated that you could take that open university model. And shift it online. So, you know, and, and actually, that may seem obvious, but at the time, people were really questioning whether that was possible, whether you, you could actually do that. Uh, and so, we sort of managed to play that you could. And so, I think in, in this version, kind of as traditional open education, if you like, shifted online and e learning, we begin to see this kind of model for large scale delivery that you can give to lots of people. And also this idea that, you know, um, innovation can happen within the existing model. It doesn't need, as disruption often claims, these people to ride in from outside of higher education. So that's what to do. So you can innovate within the existing model. Um, as Alan mentioned, I was the director of the OU's first VLE, and so I'm sure a lot of you were around at the time, since around 2002. I had a kind of similar thing where we had lots of different things around the university. You might have like the arts faculty might be using one particular uh, piece of software, the medical school would be using something else. So we had all these kind of like cottage industries, some of them bought in, some of them knocked up by looking at a cupboard, you know, whatever. So all those kind of things. And I think so what we wanted to do was get one enterprise system across the university that could roll out even kind of um, uh, support to all the students and what uh, what I came up with what my recommendation was was to adopt a, an open source really at the time we talked about this idea of plugging in lots of different tools into one system um, but I sort of stepped away after that so I, I did the easy bit of saying this is what we should do and then I let someone else actually do it um, but we, we went for open source uh, Moodle in this case partly so we could modify it to um, to meet the needs of our particular students and you know this really serves um, sort of 120,000 students 
And I think our choice of Moodle helped legitimize that open source option for lots of other universities. So here we're seeing the kind of open source model um, just be a very kind of practical solution for large scale delivery for helping students. So and the openness be part of how that operates. Um, so in 2006, um, we got funding from the Hewlett Foundation to set up OpenLearn as our uh, Open Education Resources Repository. This was after MIT and others had, had launched a kind of whole OER movement. Uh, and we have about, I think, eight, nine million visitors a year to this platform. So lots of OU material in there that's um, licensed to share through a Creative Commons license. Um, people can take it away and adapt it and reuse it elsewhere. Um, and the, the OER movement, I'll come on to MOOCs later, I think the OER movement sort of started in 2001, 2002 with MIT, and it's still going. So I think it's kind of one of those movements that didn't perhaps get all the headlines that, um, that MOOCs got, but it's been kind of a steady grower. And I think this idea that students can take material, adapt it, and so can educators, that has become quite powerful. And what we often see, for example, with OpenLearn is uh, two types of learners that I think we probably underestimate or undervalue. One is students who are thinking of studying either with us or elsewhere. And I think particularly with the idea of fees, you know, the idea that you can think, well, perhaps I'll test out whether I, whether I want to study psychology by looking at some psychology material, some psychology OERs, whatever, um, before committing to a course. And the other is students who are already studying a course and using this to kind of supplement their, their learning. So, um, here, the kind of idea of open education is, it's, again, it's a kind of efficient model, the idea that you should be able to share these things around and other people take them with that. But also kind of helping learners um, find their own way through the space and support the kind of informal learning. Take a drink. It's the other um, area I'll talk about is open educational practice, um, which can be lots of things. It's kind of a very broad term. But generally, it's kind of academics sharing their practice uh, online and some things. That, and for me, this is perhaps realised through blogging or social media. Yeah. My blog isn't quite 25 years old, uh, Alan. Uh, it's about 15 now. So, uh, but I do blog about 25 years ago. So, um, you know, I've become a blog. Lots of other people do lots of other things, you know, podcasting and those kind of things. And I think the whole point of open educational practice is that it has sharing as its kind of basis and the idea that it helps to blur the boundaries of, of academia and what it means to be a, an academic. So here again it also provides a kind of quite innovative space you can test things out um, through open educational practice and, and, and your own platform and in a, in a different way and it's quite or that I don't want to over claim about this because um, privilege and priority always sort of hierarchy always come to the surface but it can be quite democratized as well and for instance a lot of the conferences i go to now the people who are invited to give keynotes aren't necessarily you know, professors with a big long publication record they're often people who are have a good online presence and have interesting things to say whether that's via twitter blogs whatever so you know, i think it helps kind of democratize that, that space um as you know, the Open University, you know, Future Learn, again, sort of following on from stuff that's been happening in the US with Coursera and Udacity, and which again uh, came out of the open education movement. People like uh, Stephen Downs, George Siemens, and David Wiley have been experimenting with what happens if we start opening up education online to really sort of thinking about what does it mean to teach and learn in a networked context. Um, and as we know, and I think you know, MOOCs are not unproblematic. You know, but we had the kind of the big hype in 2012, um, and although I think some, a lot of that stuff was obviously overclaimed, it's still hard to argue against that. You know, millions of people are learning for free online. You know, that's a good thing. Um, but I think we do see some of that narrative around disruption, particularly arose with with MOOCs. You know, there was the whole idea that um, Sebastian Thrun, who um, was a sort of big name in the start of them suggested that in the future there's only going to be 10 global education providers and the sort of media went mad about the whole idea of disrupting higher education and this whole idea that higher edu MOOCs were the internet happening to higher education like if we've been doing none of that beforehand 
So I have, I have my, my beef with them, but they, they do represent one aspect of open education, I think. Um, so here there's kind of this model for large scale delivery. And again, coming back to the idea of innovation. So although they were claimed to be these kind of things happening to education from the outside, if you actually look at it, scratch surface, in all that innovation came from within higher education and particularly from within the open education movement, as I mentioned, those, those people have been sort of early experimenters in this area. Um, open research practice, I think, is a very interesting model, and there's probably lots of you there who practice this. But um, so, uh, as Alan said, I run what's called GoGen, the, the global network of uh, OER graduates, uh, PhD researchers, and it was set up and funded by uh, Hewlett Foundation after Fred Mulder from the OU Netherlands initially set it up. We run it now, and, and their point was that actually, the, in a new area such as OER research. Often the people who are doing that research are isolated. They're kind of like the only person in their university who might be interested in OER. Um, and so what you need to do is to grow a kind of global um, research community. And doctoral students are the best place to start with that. So what we do is you bring them together for two days every year, just before the OE Global Conference usually, uh, from all over the world, and they get to present about their research. And the feedback we get on this is just kind of amazing. So like it's kind of a lifeline, it's the thing that got them through to the end of their PhD, they formed you know, networks or friendships as, as a result of that. Um, so although it's about OER, it's the thing they're researching, I think actually what's more important is the open research practice they develop as a result. So they, they get used to publishing their findings openly, sharing their data openly, and just being um, online and sharing ideas and those kind of things. And they go off and often do very innovative things. So I think you could see this work model working for lots of other areas that are beginning to develop and are quite new as, as, as education goes forward. So here we kind of see the whole idea of open education as a, as a community and a very kind of cooperative practice. Um, open access publishing has a, a long history, so the whole idea that um, when we moved online you can make this stuff open and Lots of publishers have tried to replicate the kind of physical model, um, and even with sort of trying to introduce false scarcity by saying that with a digital book, only so many people can take it out at one time, which makes no sense. But so open access publishing, you know, lots of people do this. Um, I'm a co editor of Jime, which is an, uh, an open access journal, and I've published uh, some books, open access. Um, and I think the idea. You know, here is there's a couple of things. First of all, as soon as you realise as an academic you're not going to make any money from them, then you know what you actually want them to do is just to, to get as wide distribution as they can. And so, and, and the same with uh, articles. And so in a social media world, there's absolutely no point just going on Twitter and saying, "Here's my latest article," and when someone clicks on the link, it says, "Pay forty-five dollars to access this article." You may as well go and bury it in your back garden for that. Sort of thing. So. Um, so it kind of it makes sense in, in the digital world, but also um, it's, a, it's a way of thinking about finances. You know, the current model we have is giving our rights over to people, to companies, and then purchasing it back. Whereas you could flip that model and say, why don't we pay to produce the stuff in the first place, but make it openly licensed from there? So there is a different way of thinking about how we fund resources. So here you can think of open education as kind of really being about sharing content, sharing resources and equity so everyone has kind of equal access. It's, it's not for a, a privileged few. Um, another thing we've looked at, which is particularly big in uh, US and Canada, is the idea of open textbooks. Again, it's a form of uh, open educational resources. The idea here that uh, textbooks are expensive, particularly in the US, where they can form up to like a quarter of how much students spend. Um, and because they're kind of mandated, you have to have read this book for the course. There's been a big movement to try and set up open textbooks in their organizations such as OpenStax and BC Campus. And here they sort of aim at, aim at the big hitter course, the big hitter uh, textbooks, Psychology 101, Statistics 101, those kind of things. Um, and so the, the digital version is free, you pay uh, cost for the print version, but also people can take it and adapt it. So you might say, actually, 
we've got this chemistry book, but I don't like chapter two. I'm going to change chapter two and, and redistribute it to my, my group. Or actually, I'm going to strip out some materials that are bit relevant to them. Um, and we looked about whether that model would work in the, in the UK. And it's interesting in the UK, there isn't quite as much of an expenditure on textbooks. But I think what people are interested in is this whole idea of adaptation and making it fit your learners. So here the idea is open education as, a, as an efficient model. It's actually a more efficient way to spend your money. Um, and again, very kind of learner-centric, so they get to have a book that they can adapt and, and modify. Which brings us on to uh, open pedagogy. So I think the really interesting part of um, uh, open textbooks is getting students to train content. So um, uh, Robin DeRosa, for instance, in the US, um, wasn't very happy with the uh, textbooks you could get around um, American literature, particularly early American literature. So she paid some of her students to create an open textbook, some press books, to online, so create uh, online textbooks, and then gets her other students to um, contribute to our uh, So maybe they can contribute a, a video or they'll modify and stuff. So actually, what this begins to do then is change the students' relationship with knowledge. It's, it's that's about something you receive. Here's a book, go away and read it, rather than like, here's a textbook, let's change it together. Where do we think it's different? So here, uh, open education is seen as, again, kind of very innovative in the space that we can begin to think about what does it mean to teach, what does it mean for students to understand knowledge, to have that relationship with knowledge, a very kind of learner-centric uh, approach. So um, that's my kind of journey through uh, open education up to now. I just want to talk briefly about a um, small project we did around mapping up open education. So, um, at a conference where I was there face to face, a few of us were, I think we were in a pub, uh, and we were moaning about, um, you know, it's like when academics get together, they like a moan. So we were moaning about how um, lots of new people in the education didn't reference stuff that had gone before. So uh, Viv Rolf had done some work on this and so found all these kind of seminal papers from the 1970s about uh, open education, which were hardly ever referenced. So the feeling was, all these areas of open education, broadly under that, that title, weren't really talking to each other. Uh, but we wanted to test whether that was actually true or just that kind of grumpy old person's perspective. Um, and so I worked with um, a former PhD student of mine, uh, Katie Jordan, who's a whiz. She developed the citation analysis uh, method where what you do is you take, so we came up with a search, we came up with um, sort of top articles of um, in open education and stripped out the citations of those and then found which papers those those ones cited. And from that you then develop a citation network. This should be a lovely working GIF. Anyway, so what you end up with is this. So the, the, the bigger the blob, the more people have cited that and a, and a, a link shows that people are citing that paper from somewhere else. And so we, we found kind of roughly, so we mapped these areas on. We can see there are kind of certain hubs developing. So we kind of found roughly what we mapped by eight different groups. So up in the top left, you've got uh, open open access publishing. Um, and those things tend to be a lot of kind of library science, information science. Uh, you've got social media for academics over in, in the left. Um, you've got this big group of OER in the middle, MOOCs. Then down at the bottom, you've got this group of uh, open education schools, which is kind of very specific. Uh, over on the right, you've got the kind of early distance education and open learning, the sort of stuff that came out of the university. E learning then sort of forms a bridge between that and, and the MOOC area. And then you've got this sort of blob up in the middle, which almost happened like the glue of open practice to keep it together. But I think it's bore out our grumpy old person's perspective, actually, they don't cite each other very much, you know, so the MOOC people don't really talk to the distance education, open learning people, and actually there's an awful lot for them to learn from them, so it's partly that sort of eye-rolling thing I had when MOOCs were becoming popular, like they were sort of discovering all this stuff, you think, we've been doing this for years <laughs> in open education, so I think it's interesting how even in a, an area that you might call open education, 
the, all these silos then um, reinforce themselves. And I think there's a part of what we need to do in order for open education to become the kind of anti-disruption is to help break down some of these, these silos, I think. So um, I've been talking quite uncritically about open education um, and lots of my open education friends would, uh, would turn me off for that. So I'm proposing that as, a, as, a, as always a good thing and that's not necessarily true. So um, it's not magic, it's not a kind of a magic bullet or anything. Um, and there are lots of issues around open education. So and MOOCs were uh, very popular people are going to talk about kind of cultural imperialism, this idea that you're getting a kind of particularly a US university um, education sort of foisted upon uh, other countries. Um, and there's this idea of open washing. So uh, companies, in the idea of greenwashing, where companies claim to be green and natural, because those are positive words. So we see lots of companies claiming to do openness and open access and those kind of things. Um, and they're not really. Um, there's there are lots of issues around open source communities, around uh, misogyny and roles of gender and people feeling excluded. So they are by no means a kind of good model to adopt for a community. Although it, it's interesting, a lot of that comes from, I think, the founders. I think a lot of those founders in early open source communities were those type of people. Um, but even the other open source communities growing very much more. Um, principles in place. And there's an idea of neoliberalism around kind of, particularly with uh, OER, everything's about the content that you use as an academic would use, use content that takes, that's taken elsewhere and used elsewhere, and it's just about the stuff. Um, and I think there's real issues around academic labour, a lot of openness, particularly kind of open practice online and Twitter and stuff, happens for free, you know, and actually lots of universities rely on their academics and we're seeing this a lot with the kind of current uh, crisis the coronavirus crisis actually loads of people are off in support very good you know and i'm part of that you know, if you need help going online we can do that but actually it's a lot of it's kind of free academic labor so all those all those are probably more are important issues around open education that we shouldn't gloss over each of those is, is another keynote of your own, i think um so I think, um, sort of coming to conclusion, I, even given those problems, I think if you put in place the right attitude and work critically to think about how you're implementing openness, there are some sort of threads that go through it that I think make it a good contender against um, disruption. So it does have sharing as a default sort of built into it, which kind of operates against the, the anti-cooperative, anti-collaboration model disruption it suggests that adaptation within a sector is good it's not about dismissing the whole sector it values kind of principally uh, existing expertise the whole point of sharing and reuse is just saying here's something that's really good and i really like it i'm going to take it and adapt it to fit my purpose but i'm still acknowledging it through the creative common class as being useful that's very different to our disruption as well, probably. Um, it allows a route in for new voices. So it's not saying it's only the incumbents who have things to say. So I think particularly through open educational practice, the new, new voices very quickly can come to the surface. Um, it can have built into it, if you work hard enough, transparency, the idea that you, know, you can track changes, you can see what people are doing. There's, there's a whole community around this stuff and people say, that is that person's idea? And you can sort of build up around that. So it's not trying to keep things closed. Um, it is largely anti-monopoly. So you're open in practice and you want to share and you want other people to take that. And it can, but not, but doesn't naturally, like by default, it can make it work for social justice and things like the open universities. So my pitch to you is that makes it a better fit for education than talking about uh, disruption. So my final, if I if you go away from here with one thing, um, I think it's to understand or to think that the language we use is important. And disruption is really a metaphor, but we don't think of it as a metaphor. People think of it as fact, and it's not. It's a metaphor for how things can work. And metaphors carry with them an implicit set of assumptions and connotations. And I would argue 
just talking about disruption actually carries with it a whole load of implication that I don't think are good for education. And so if you take one thing away, it's not necessarily that open education is a better thing than disruption. It's that as soon as you hear disruption, you should think about what other models might be and why are we talking about disruption? We could be talking about socialism of higher education, whatever you want. You know, so but there are a load of things in that use of the term disruption. And it's not a neutral term. Um, so I'm going to end there. I probably got too quick. You tend to speak online. Um, but as Alan said, my dog is really the star. So there's my dog as a puppy. That's Tylo. Uh, and you can access the um, slides there. And also, I've been recording this uh, in Click Meeting. So I can, uh, I'll put the recording up uh, online as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martin.